the period of the judges was a time of turmoil. I don't know if that's the best word to describe it or not. They were continually going through transition. Transition from when Joshua was the leader, transition from obedience to idolatry and sinful behavior to God's chastising of them by sending some of their enemies against them. Then they would cry for help and then God would answer and send a judge. And even though the word judge primarily refers to the making of important decisions, one of the major rules, uh, roles that the judges had was to deliver them or lead the deliverance away from the oppressors. The oppressors might have been Mesopotamians, they might have been the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Midianites. There was even internal civil war that one of the judges had to deal with. Then the Ammonites, the Philistines on several occasions. Because they did not drive the people out of the land God had promised to give them, God let those people stay to test the Israelites. And I'm thinking they didn't do well. It was a time of continual transition. Deborah was one of those who was involved in that. In fact, here is, here's the verse that describes that period in Judges 21 and verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so we come down past Deborah. Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzan, Eglon, Abdon, Samson, which brings us down to the days of Eli. The spiritual quality of the judges seemed to have been to some degree on a downhill slide following Deborah. They weren't all bad, but some of them weren't all good. Samson had trouble with trying to find too many women. He got in trouble because he wouldn't keep the secret that he was supposed to keep. And so following him was Eli. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. In Samuel 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 17, the text says, Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Now, this did not mean that they didn't offer the sacrifice they did, but they would demand of the person bringing the sacrifice that they give them the choicest piece of the meat while it was still raw, before, biblically, it had been boiled. And so they would take that meat, and it says in one verse that if they didn't give them the meat, then they said, we will take it by force. And so they were despising the offerings that the people were, were giving, and they were despising the God to whom these offerings were to be made. And so we have a period of transition. Elias, Elias seemed to be doing fairly well. But I want to read to you 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 25. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He said to them, I want you to listen to this. This is sorry. Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my son, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But <coughs> they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now I read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. God is talking to Eli. 
And we're going to discover in this passage that Eli was apparently participating in the benefit of the meat these sons had taken wrongfully. Listen to this. Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you, he's talking to Eli, why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offerings which I've commanded in my dwelling and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel. You know, sometimes we forget that Eli was not the man God wanted him to be. Chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, verses 34 through 35. This will be a sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. If you know who he's talking about, raise your hand. Do you know? And I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before me in my anointed ways always. Yes, he's talking about Samuel. Samuel came into being in a rather unusual way. His mother, Hannah, with his father, Elkanah, barren at the time of any children. But Hannah was praying to God about the fact that she had no son. Eli guessed that she was drunk and told her to quit drinking. She said, I'm not drinking. My heart is broken. And my heart is broken because I do not have a son. But if I have a son, well, let me read to you 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 11. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. She brings him back to Eli, probably around the age of 7 to 10. It says after he was weaned. That doesn't mean necessarily just nursing from his mother or drinking from a bottle. It means when he is no longer under the primary responsibility of his mother and would start being under the primary responsibility of his father. For this boy I prayed, she says to Eli, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I ask him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there with Eli. Chapter 2, verse 11. Then Elkanah, that's her husband, and Hannah went to his home at Ramah. But the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. Transition is coming. And that's what I picked up about Samuel. I know there's a lot of things I could say about Samuel, but what I wanted to look at were the ways in which Samuel dealt with the transition that was occurring in his world. The first thing he had to deal with, the very first thing he had to deal with, was Eli's sons and Eli himself 
dishonoring the offerings of God. Think about that for a moment. Here is young Samuel. Here is Eli and his sons. They didn't have an influence on him. Even though there was a time of transition with Eli and his sons, Samuel stayed strong. It is not easy to stay strong when the people around you are not. It is indeed a challenge. One night, Samuel is in bed. Samuel? Samuel? Samuel hops out of bed, goes into Eli and says, What do you want? Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Samuel goes back to bed. Samuel? Samuel? He runs to Eli and he said, You did call me. Eli said, No, I didn't. But the Lord is. So the next time you hear your name called, say, Here am I. 1 Samuel 3, 11 through 14. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Samuel is still a young person, perhaps a teenager by now. We don't know for sure. I know all the pictures show him to be about seven or eight. We just don't know. But he was young at this time. And God is putting this on his heart and his mind. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. There's nothing you can do to keep this from happening. Now what does he do? Eli calls him and he says, What did God say to you? And I want you to tell me the truth or you will be in serious trouble. Do you tell the truth at a time like that or do you, do you lie? Or do you have the character that Samuel had and just lay it all out like God had said? And that's what he did. And even while Eli was still alive and his sons were still alive, 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 21 says this, Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, that means from top to bottom, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. If things are not like you want to want them to be in your world, can you still be strong? <clears throat> you see, as far as Samuel is concerned, he only saw his mother and daddy once a year. But here's Eli, and here's Hophni and Phineas making all kind of evil things, especially Hophni and Phineas. Eli not rebuking them. 
And the way he rebuked them, it's almost like he says, now boys, you shouldn't be doing that. God won't like it. That is not a rebuke. They maintain their position. But what does Samuel do in this struggle with transition, knowing that God's going to bring Eli's house to an end, but knowing that Eli and Hophni and Phinehas are still in control. And as promised by God, in view of the evil that had been tolerated by Eli and practiced by his sons, the Philistines come against the Israelites. They are being defeated. And Hophni and Phinehas have a wonderful idea. Let's take the Ark of the Covenant with us to battle. And surely God will anything bad happen to the Ark of the Covenant. And so they take the Ark of the Covenant into battle. And as soon as it enters the areas where the soldiers were, the Israelite soldiers shout for joy. And the Philistines tremble. But the commander of the Philistines says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. For all practical purposes, that's just noise. And so the Philistines came and fought against Israel. They kill Hophni and Phinehas on the same day, and they take the Ark of the Covenant back home. Now the runner who knows of the battle, an Israelite, runs back to Eli. And the Bible says Eli, may I put it in my own terminology, was really, really fat. And he was sitting in a chair. And the runner comes up and Eli said, how did the battle go? And he said, we are being defeated and your sons Hophni and Phinehas are dead. And he falls over backward and breaks his neck and dies on the spot. Times of transition. And now, Samuel is in the driver's seat. It goes well for a while. It goes well for a while. And then it changes. Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel. If you return to the Lord with all your heart, 1 Samuel 7, 3 and 4, remove the foreign gods and the Astaroth from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve Him alone, He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Astaroth and served the Lord alone. And interestingly enough, 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 13 says, so the Philistines were subdued and they did not come anymore within the border of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. But Samuel grew older and he appointed his sons as priests. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 3 through 7, and I'm only reading verse 3 right now. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. If I'm reading the character of Eli correctly, it didn't seem to bother him a whole lot. But if I'm reading the character of Samuel correctly, I think it bothered him a great deal. There is one difference between these two instances. Eli's sons were working with him in the same area. Samuel was working in an area up northern of where the sons were working down south. And so they weren't in his immediate presence but they still were taking bribes and perverting justice. We're ready for the next case. Well, 
here's my bag of money. I know you're a fair and honest judge. I just want to support you in what you're doing. Oh, well, the judgment falls in your favor. Now, I want to read to you what happens next in verses 4 through 7. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together. Oh, incidentally, this is another time of transition. Do you see it coming? Faithful during Samuel's era, his sons appointed, becoming unfaithful, transitions on its way. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you've grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for a, a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. What did he do in this time of transition? He took it to God. He took it to God in prayer. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to what they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So go find a king. Go find a king. And he does. And he finds a man by the name of Saul. And he anoints Saul as king. And one of the first things that Saul does is violate the will of God. He offers a sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel to come and do it. Saul was not a priest. Samuel was. And that's not all. He's told to go out and wipe out the Amalekites. And what does he do? He brings the Amalek king back as a prize of victory. And he was told to wipe out all the animals. And when Samuel goes to him, he hears the, the mooing of the cattle. And he hears the bleeding of the sheep and the goats. And Samuel says, what is this sound that I'm hearing? And Saul says, oh, it was the people. The people wanted to bring back the animals to offer for sacrifices to God. You know what I'm reminded of? I'm reminded of a child who is told, do not get a cookie out of that jar. And so the mother goes into the kitchen, and here is the child with the cookie in his hand. And you know what that child says? I got this for you, Mommy. That's Saul. That's Saul. 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. Samuel said to Saul, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. There's a parallel that's coming up. Do you remember when Samuel came into the presence of God? Eli was still functioning as judge. His sons were still functioning as evil priests. And 1 Samuel 16, verses 11 through 13 tell us, And Samuel said to Jesse, Samuel's on his way to appoint this man who is after God's own heart. Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he's tending the sheep. Seven sons of Jesse had already passed in front of Samuel, and Samuel had been told by God, that's not the one, that's not the one, that's not the one. In fact, the first one that came through, Samuel thought, surely that's him because he's strong and healthy, and, and God said no. Six more no's, 
And so he says to Jesse, are these all? There remains yet the youngest, Jesse tells him, and behold, he's tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. We'll not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and handsome appearance, and the Lord said, Rise, anoint him, for this is he. Wait a minute, who's king? Saul is. And Saul is going to remain king for a number of years. And David is going to grow under the reign of Saul until Saul dies, just like Samuel grew under the leadership, if you want to call it that, of Eli and the evil priesthood of his sons. Is it possible for a person to grow spiritually in some of the most adverse circumstances? And the answer is only if that person chooses to do so. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Transition continues. David rises. They even had a saying about it. David has killed his 10,000 and Saul his thousands. And Saul is not only filled with jealousy, but something that is even worse happens to Saul. God withdraws his spirit and his communication. He will not communicate with Saul in any shape, form, or fashion. 1 Samuel 25, 1. Before David ever is crowned king, Samuel dies. Then Samuel died, and all Israel gathered together and mourned for him, and buried him at his house in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. He still wasn't king. Saul is in trouble. He is in bad trouble. The Philistines are coming against him. Am I going to win? Am I going to be defeated? I need to know what's going to happen. God isn't talking to me. And so I read to you 1 Samuel 28, 15 through 19. He went to a witch at Endor, and he asked the witch to raise Samuel's spirit up from the grave. And she says to him, I can't do that. King Saul said he would kill any." anyone who practiced that kind of thing. He said, I won't let it happen. And then she realized who it was, who it would be in a few moments later. So Samuel is raised. God allows it to happen. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disquieted me by bringing me up? For Samuel 28, 15 and following. And Saul answered, I'm greatly distressed for the Philistines are waging war against me. And God has departed from me and no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore I've called you, that you may make known to me what I should do. And Samuel said, Why then do you, do you ask me, since the Lord has departed from you and has become your <coughs> adversary? Folks, if there's anything you do not want in your life, it's for God to be your adversary. The Lord has done according as He spoke through me, Samuel continues, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, to David. As you did not obey the Lord, do you get the problem that's going on here with Eli, his sons, with Samuel's sons, with Saul? They're not obeying God they're doing God's will the way they want it done. Eli's sons, did they accept sacrifices? Yes, they did. But they were accepting them the way they wanted to accept them. Was Eli dealing with the wickedness of his sons? Yes, the way he wanted to, by slapping their hand.
as you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his fierce wrath, wrath on Amalek, so the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. You heard that. Tomorrow you die. Indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Times of transition. What does it take to survive times of transition? Well, I want to look at the character of Samuel, but I want to take verses out of the New Testament. I think one thing that Samuel had was strong character. And I like what it says in Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, transition times, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character. Proven character. And proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our own hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Number two. Strong faith. Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death. Be faithful even if it costs you your life. And I will give you the crown of life. Number three. Amazing courage. You go into Eli and you tell him what God has said. You go up to, to, to Saul who's king... And you say, what is this I'm here? You disobeyed God. God's going to take the kingdom out of your hand. Amazing courage. Mark chapter 15, verse 43. This is an interesting, this is a very interesting event. Because this man was one of the rulers of the Jewish people. And the Sanhedrin had just days before condemned Jesus Christ to be killed. But this is one of the men in the Sanhedrin. There was also another one who was important. His name was Nicodemus. This man is Joseph of Arimathea. And I want you to listen to what he did. Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate, and ask for the body of Jesus. Do you realize what he did? By that one act, he effectively resigned from one of the most prominent positions in the land of Israel among the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin. And he made it public. How public? Well, he went to Pilate himself. Amazing courage. Character, faith, courage, and discerning wisdom. Everyone who partakes only of milk, in other words, stay a newborn Christian, not growing, is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he's an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Do you know why some people can't figure out that some things are wrong and some things are right? Because they don't try to practice either one. They just go along with whatever the culture is doing. There was a preacher in California years ago who decided to establish 
what he thought would be an amazing church. So how did he decide what this church was going to be like? He went into the community. If I were him, I would say to Kay up on the front row, what would you like to have in a church? And I would write that down and I would say to Robbie, Robbie, what would you like to have in a church? Amos, what would you like to have in a church? Well, he wound up with a church where you could drive your car up, put the speaker in the window, and that's how you could attend church. But that's only one of the ways. He also had it so that when he made a particular point in his sermon that he wanted to emphasize, the fountains of water would gush high out of the fountains in front of the auditorium. What kind of a church would you like? What kind of a church would you like? The reason some people don't have wisdom is because they go to the wrong place for it, which is to God and His Word. And that's exactly where Samuel went. But all of that without appropriate action is pretty easy. Appropriate action. I like the way Jesus put it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts <coughs> on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Do you want to survive periods of transition in your life? Do you want to survive periods of transition in our culture? Do you want to survive periods of transition that seem almost impossible? Then build your character, strengthen your faith, grow in your courage, Develop discerning wisdom. Take appropriate action. And I've chosen a woman <coughs> to demonstrate this very thing. In Acts chapter 2, verses... I mean, I've chosen a result in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. And I will tell you about a woman who did this. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And I'm reminded of a woman and the reason I picked her was because our lesson today started with Deborah. That was our last Sunday's lesson. Her name was Lydia and she and a a group of women were in the city of Philippi down by the river holding a prayer service. Paul and his companions found them. They preached the gospel to them and Lydia was baptized and said, if you consider me faithful, make, I'm doing my own interpretation, make your headquarters while you're here my house. Come and stay with me. You going through transitions? I'm thinking of two of the young ladies that I see here from time to time, seniors in high school. You're going to be going through a period of transition. Are you ready? I hope so. I know that some are going through periods of transition with physical illnesses. Are you ready? I know some are going through periods of transition on the job. <coughs> How are you doing? <coughs> I know some of us are going through the transition from middle age to this other age that follows that. How are we handling it? We will come through victorious. 
if we stay with him. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation, and my invitation is, has already well been stated in the five characteristics that I listed. If you need to be baptized into Christ and you never have been, we can make that available to you. If you need to rededicate your life to the Lord and become one of those people that are continually devoting himself, herself, let us know so we can support you. We want you to go home feeling and being blessed because you're right with God. Let's stand and sing.